Okay, all right, good morning. Then let me introduce Jerry. Jerry holds a BA from Calvin University, an MA from the University of Minnesota in geography, an MA from the University of Michigan in education, and a certificate as a specialist in administration from Michigan State University. Jerry was a K-12 teacher, superintendent of Hamilton Community Schools, and a part-time geography instructor at Hope College, Muskegon Community College, Davenport, Grand Valley State, and that other school in Grand Rapids that I won't name, <laughs> um, as well as a seasoned instructor for us here at HASP. Welcome, Jerry. Well, thank you. okay. Well, thank you for that, um, Kim. And we'll just get started and get going if I can. I hope people can hear me. And if you can't, I guess you will notify Kim. Okay. Now then, um, Teresa is still out, evidently. I haven't seen her anyway. Right. Okay. Uh, we'll get started here. Uh, this little cartoon reminded me of what I have to do. I have to write a report on rivers and it's due next week. Well, it's due right now, so I, I, and I don't want a failing grade. But we'll get going here with this map that you probably have in your position. Uh, your quizzes probably have been downloaded to you also. Uh, we're looking at this western half this time today and you can see most of them, not all of the, the um, rivers that we'll be looking at on this particular map. Here's a list of them that we'll be looking at. Uh, Rio Grande, the Colorado and the green that feeds it, Gila, Sacramento and San Joaquin in the Central Valley, comes way toward the end of the presentation, and the Humboldt that goes nowhere, and uh, the Columbia Snake, which is a combination in Washington State and so forth. Okay, we'll start with the Rio Grande. It, just for your information, it's not navigable. You can't get in here and go all the way up, but it starts up here in Colorado. We'll see that in just a moment. It's not navigable, but it is, um, full of, uh, let's see, dams and diversions. It, there are several enduric basins, which means they are, uh, they go nowhere. They do not outlet into the Gulf at all. These basins dry up and stay right where they are. And so the river, that part of the river does not move on. So uh, the, Tributaries that come in have many of those basins. They stop right there. Now, here it starts up here in Colorado. And notice that the basin here is the watershed it is quite large, except it's in quite a bit of the dry country. What they get is a lot of fast uh, thunderstorms that just really hit them hard and then so they do get quite a bit of water in spite of the fact that they are in a dry area. There's one river down here in New Mexico, Conscious, which enters the Rio Grande as it comes uh, near Texas border. Rio Grande joins at this point. If you take a look at the Rio Grande, as a border between Mexico and the United States. And so a number of cities which may be familiar to you are on the border. And uh, so you wind up with uh, uh, the uh, Brownsville down in here as it starts to enter into or very close to getting into the Gulf of Mexico. Starts up in Colorado near a place called Creo, Credo, Colorado. Nice looking place up in the Rockies. Notice this particular map has many, many diversions. Diversions and dams on the Rio Grande. 
So using water that they can have and all the little um, red spots here, either as a diversion or a dam. One of the interesting places happens to be Big Bend National Park. And Big Bend is right next to the border, obviously. Uh, the park is in this bend, um, and uh, that is a place you can cross. Let's see once what that looks like. Here is a crossing at Big Bend. And in fact, I walked across it and ruined my shoes, shoes doing so because they got wet. And I didn't dare to go with, uh, without shoes on because it's very rocky and it would have hurt my feet. At this point in El Paso, it is three feet deep. So it is a crossing area for if you want to walk across. However, they now have built a bridge to cross at El Paso. And of course, many of the uh, Mexicans have crossed over into El Paso to do their shopping for many years. Now, and then, of course, with the latest couple of years, that's a lot of that has stopped because of uh, the not permission to come into the United States. Question is, shall we build a wall? Where do you want to build it? Same thing would be a pr problem here. Where would you put the wall? At the Big Bend. This is a good crossing place for people who wish to just wade across. This is what it looks like when you get close to the Brownsville, which is near the Gulf. All right. Near Big Bend, you do have a canyon that the uh, Rio Grande goes through. We switch, we switch now to the Colorado River. And let's start up here, if you will. The Flaming Gorge Reservoir is up in this area, and many of you, I, or some of you probably have been there. Uh, you go down into the area of Lake Powell, which is by Page. We will be talking about Lee Ferry, Lee's Ferry. And then on, we will also be talking about the uh, Lake Havasu, Lake Mead, and on down into the Baja, California. A picture of the Colorado, and this does show the Green River, which is a beautiful canyon in, in itself, uh, as it joins the Colorado at this point. It's one of the major tributaries. And gathering water from this whole place and bringing it on down to uh, at near Las Vegas and eventually winding down into the uh, Gulf of California. Again, just a quick pictures to show that. Here's Page. We'll be looking at Page in just a moment. And here's the Lake Mead, and the canyon is Grand Canyon is between those places. Lake Havasu is way down here, and finally you get down to Yuma and into the Mexico border. The backup of the, can, the um, dam at Page, which you will see in a moment, but notice that it backs up the water uh, quite a long ways. And you will see that if you are on this lake, uh, Lake Powell it's called now, and you can get all the way up to Rainbow Bridge if you want to take your boat up that direction. And then it gets rougher as you get on up a little bit further of the Colorado River. But uh, here's a little bit picture. Here is the Green Glen Canyon Dam on the Colorado, right next to Page. Page is down here. And observation spot here, you can look right down into the 
Colorado River. Another nice picture of the dam and the Lake Powell starts at this point, of course. If you ever want to go there, I guess you can rent uh, a houseboat and go up into Lake Powell and uh, enjoy the area and sleep on the houseboat and keep traveling upriver. This is one place you can stop and get out, sunbathe a little bit on the sandbar or swim, but it's just beautiful, the formations are. Just as a picture of more of the areas where you can motor boat your way in and look at the beautiful scenery. It's all Lake Powell. In this particular part of the Colorado River, it's uh, the Reflection Lake, it's into Utah, but it's still Colorado River. And look how it meanders around back and forth. And you know what meanders look like from your, from the um, presentation last week. Rainbow, Bill, Rainbow Red Bridge, you can finally make it if you do uh, use a boat. A little picture of the dam from the other side. Notice that water leaves the Lake Powell in a, they, well, it's controlled in, that's, as to how much has to go into the Colorado River down here, downstream. And at this point, just below the dam, will be a place where you can enter into a float boat, if you wish. A, a, you start over in this particular spot of the dam, uh, below the dam, and uh, wander all the way on down to, for several miles. However, you, don't, you do not get into rough water on this particular short trip. It's only 30 miles. Again, notice where the dam is and the area of Page, which has its own airport. So uh, if you wish to take your vacation down in that area, you can certainly fly in. Lee's Ferry has its own designation from Page to Lee's Ferry. You get into one of these big float boats and uh, they will, it's smooth riding. It's not a big problem at all. So not until you get below Page that you start to get into the rough waters of the Colorado, Colorado, Colorado River. Here you go with a couple of boats that you can see. They probably hold maybe 15 to 20 people. This particular map shows you where the Glen Canyon Dam is. That's up in here by Page. We will stop and look at a, at a place called uh, Lee's Ferry, which is down here. But in the meantime, the, it really travels all throughout the meanders. And you will find even petroglyphs that the Indians have put in, in, in or ancient in India, Indians anyway, put in years and years, many years ago. This part of Grand Canyon is called Marble Canyon. Steeps on both sides. And if you're going down on your float boat, you cannot park any place until you get to Lee's Ferry. I show you this because it is so amazing, all of the different layers of sandstone and shale and everything else, limestone, that deposited into this area over many, many millions of years. So uh, this, of course, has all been eroded down and you can see the various uh, layers. It's not rather amazing. A different view of Marble Canyon, so you know the sides are high. You don't park any place anywhere near here if you are on a float boat. 
is parked at Lee's Ferry, the only place to cross in the 700 miles of Canyon Country. It's located in Marble Canyon at the beginning of the 277 miles down the Grand Canyon. And that's where you don't want to go unless you are experienced with a, your own float boat. Ferry had to fight strong currents. This is where you could get on the ferry and cross over. It was reached from the east side by a very treacherous road. Why is it called Lee's Ferry? Well, the guy's name was John D. Lee. He was exiled by the Mormons, by the Mormon church in 1857 for his role in the slaughter of 120 Gentile settlers. He and several members of the Mormon church along with the Paiute Indians were involved in this slaughter. So he and his wife, wives quickly went down to this part of the river and settled at the crossing, which is now known as Lee's Ferry. He was captured later and executed. That building is still there, I think. At least it was there when I saw it some years ago, but that was his house. And it does show you a picture, some kind of a picture of the, of the execution time of this group. Lee's Ferry. Well, okay. We're moving back onto the Colorado River, Colorado River and find out that Glen Canyon is here Let's move on down to toward Hoover Dam and eventually we'll look at the Imperial Valley and eventually uh, we'll be right at the border. So the Green River, of course, I mentioned before, enters up here. Marble Canyon, we're back to Marble Canyon. And there are, well, there's an old bridge and a new bridge that goes over Marble Canyon at this point. And back here are the Vermilion Mountains of the Rockies. And we'll show you those in just a moment. But the bridge, the new bridge and the old bridge, uh, make it across. It's about the only, that's the only one that crosses the Colorado at all in this area after, after Page. The Vermilion Cliffs, they're, they're beautiful. They are examples of the deposits of sandstone and limestone and so forth in layers. And then it was been uh, bowed up through earthquakes and the like until you finally get a bunch that are on top of the uh, wave. And this particular wave does show up. Now, just to give you an example of this, there's a famous wave uh, rock, wave rock in Australia, and I'll show you that in a minute, and you can see the immensity of it. It's 50 feet high. This is in Australia now, near Perth. It's 350 feet long. So if you put a couple people in there, it looks like that. And it does look like a wave, like you were out in the ocean and the wave come, comes in and uh, breaks over you, except this one does not. It stays right where it's at, obviously. Back to Marble Canyon. We see uh, one of the float boats in that particular area. And now we go, uh, Lee's, Ferry, Lee's Ferry is around the bend. Let's now leave that whole area and come into the Grand Canyon National Park. Notice where Lake Mead is and uh, how you can get into the park itself. But you stay on the rim unless you really want to float down the river. Notice the hoodoos uh, that are 
uh, sculptured by the wind, but basically on top of what was left after the erosion of the water took place. Wind and erosion, wind and water really do the, <coughs> do the erosion. It's not unusual at all to see uh, thunderstorms in those areas. And then of course, when you get that, you get flash floods as well. The flash floods will continue to cover and uh, erode more in some of the rivers that are out there. There, there are three formations here in this particular group. And uh, maybe you can see them, one in here and one over there, and then one way back there. Different names to those formations. And once again, just a quick here to show you that there are a lot of layers in these formations. On the side here, you will see the ages that are, uh, are listed. The Permian, the Pennsylvanian, Mississippian, and Devonian, and all the way down to the Precambrian. When the, these were formed. One of the things that you do see here is it goes all the way down to bedrock and something called the Zoroaster granite and the Vishu schist that's down on the bottom. Here's the bottom of the canyon. Oh, has anybody been on this one? If someone has, you might want to comment. Making of the Skywalk. It's owned by the Indian tribe. But it's pretty high, 4,000 feet above the, the river in comparison to these other tall buildings around the world. If you can imagine yourself, if you haven't been there, and I have not, it was built after I was in the, in the area. Uh, it's a long way down, and you look through the glass. Didn't didn't some people fall off of there too? Is that the one that that's somewhere in the news? I don't remember someone falling off, but I I wouldn't be a bit surprised that that happened. I don't know how you'd have to be very conscious of how to fall off because uh, there's a guard plastic around it as you can see here. How about the people who can look straight down then from this point? The cleaners, how would you like to clean this thing? They clean the glass floor. And I don't know whether it was maybe one of these people happened to fall. I'm not sure, but they they're pretty good climbers and they know what they're doing. You have to wear your soft slippers if you're going to be on it. But you look right straight down through the glass. Oh. If you look to the side, well, I guess this didn't happen. The skywalk shows <laughs> Walt Disney coming in. The Diamond Creek Road is at the lower end of the Grand Canyon National Park. It's the only road to the bottom of the Grand Canyon West, Grand Canyon West. And if you want to go down to that road, uh, you have to pay the tribe $12. It may be more right now. That's what I had to pay anyway. It is 20 miles, 21 miles. The last few miles of that particular road is really not the road, but it is the creek. The road and the creek become synonymous. So you better have a four wheel drive vehicle. The Hualapai Indians own the road and millions of acres around it. Let's go back to this one and a couple of things that I want you to remember uh, as we go to the other slides. First of all, here is Peach Springs. Peach Springs is where you depart to go to the Grand Canyon, which this, I don't know if you can see my little arrow or not, 
but you wind up at that particular spot in the Grand Canyon, and we'll show you that in a, in a moment or two. But also on this particular map is something called 66. 66 is a highway that I'll talk about in just a little bit. So, but Peach Springs is on that highway and uh, so are in a couple of other little towns. The Diamond Road looks like this, all right? A little bit of a problem with that particular vehicle. Now, the road is this stream. Keep on going down the road and you wind up in this niche way down into the bottom of the Grand Canyon. So, uh, and it's right there with, as it has cut through the Vishu schist and the ancient granite that you see here. Now, that is when you wind up seeing the Colorado River at the, uh, as you enter, uh, as a Diamond River enters the Colorado River. And at that particular point, because they know there are tourists, they, um, there's a picnic table and you can take your picnic down there and enjoy the scenery and people come down there and fish, I guess. But you have to pay your uh, $12 unless you are a native. Once again, look at those formations, all these different ones. They've been named and you can study hey, them. Hey, down at the bottom that you showed, can, can you boat or kayak or canoe down there? Yes, you can. Good question. Thank you. You can, uh, you can put your boat in at that point and float on down and I think maybe wind up in Lake Mead. So, um, just a little bit about that. When I was a teenager in high school, we flew from Las Vegas into Marble Canyon uh, and, uh, and there was only one bridge there, the Navajo Bridge. And then we disembarked on those same type of rafts that you showed in your pictures uh, at Lee's Ferry and spent nine days uh, camping out and going through the Grand Canyon. And we pulled out, as your point, uh, in Lake Mead. It was an amazing experience. Thank you very much for that contribution. I really appreciate that. Uh, I have not known anybody that actually took the trip, so I'm glad you uh, you mentioned that. That's great. Anybody else want to comment about this? Beautiful scenery. I've been waiting for the classroom here to open up and show some of these pictures on those two big screens that come up. But uh, we have to just get along with the little ones on our on our laptops. Hoover Dam. It's part of it, Lake Mead, holding Lake Mead back. So here is the drainage area for the Colorado, Colorado River area. And notice that uh, it's quite a large area, but it is also, well, Lake Powell Dam swap part of it. And of course they use the water extensively as it leaves Lake Mead. Because Lake Mead is, furnishes a lot of water for areas below, which we will look at in just a moment. Picture of Lake Mead. And of course you can see sometimes it's this high and some is a little higher. That's the white that shows up. I told you there was a Lake Havasu down, down, just a little ways further down the line. Well, London Bridge is actually the London Bridge from England. This guy had too much money, I think. He bought the bridge and he brought it all over and he wanted it over here as a tourist attraction. So it is actually the London Bridge from England at Lake Havasu. Oh, looks like I've hit the quiz time and this poor little kid has had a little bit of a problem. 
Are you ready for the quiz? We'll go through that a moment. If you've filled it out as we were going along, why uh, you should have the right answers. Everyone who takes the quiz in my classes always gets 100%. Is that right? I'll go through it quickly so that you, uh, if you can't read this. Number one in uh, Andoric is H or how. Number two is king. Number three is able. Number four is easy. Number five is jig. Number six is Mike. Number seven is Nan. Number eight is Fox. Number nine is Dog. Number 10 is George. Number 11 is Baker. Number 12 is Love. And number 13 is Charlie. Now I should go back up to number two. I should use the uh, you know, the alphabet that is phonetic. And I should not have said King, I should have said Kim. K for two. How about that, Kim? I talked about this Route 66 a little bit ago. Now let's talk about it a little bit more. Back in 1926, it got paved. It was a gravel road all the way from Chicago to Cal to Los Angeles. And uh, it was quoted as a very important uh, tourist thing. And you could travel all the way down. And it being paved helped a lot. It was just a two lane thing at that point. So uh, there are some areas that are still visible on it. For instance, this one is in Mount Olive, Illinois. That gas station was preserved on 66. Uh, they crossed on the locks here, but and since then they built bridges to cross the Mississippi River at St. Louis. But it is still marked on 66. There's one in Sham Shamrock, Texas. Angolia. Another one in Adrian, Texas, and it looks, it says here midpoint. So when you got to this point, why you better stop for lunch. This one was not preserved very well in New Mexico, but it's still there. In Albuquerque, they just took that uh, highway 66 and they widened it out and made it a uh, the Central Avenue in Albuquerque. So it doesn't look like an old thing anymore there. But if you go to Seligman in Arizona, you can buy your ice cream cone here if you wish. Looking at 66 for just a moment. Here's the uh, Seligman that I just mentioned. And you can go on through Kingman and eventually you wind up uh, crossing the Colorado <coughs> at this point. If you have to go and see the London Bridge, then you'll have to take a little side trip down to Lake Havasu. And uh, once again, Peach Springs is at this point and that have to travel through the reservation to get to the bottom point of the Grand Canyon. Uh, the final place is in Santa Monica, California. 66 is, is the terminal end, uh, terminal of the 66 highway. Well, very few people travel 66 anymore. Let's take a look at a couple rivers here. Colorado is coming in down toward the Mexican border. It is associated somewhat with Phoenix, only because Phoenix needs some of its water. The 
Gila River is joined by the Salt River and the Verde and the San Pedro. These rivers then go through or right near Phoenix. It's kind of interesting that the uh, Indians knew how to capture some of that water. In the canals of the near Phoenix, Tempe actually is the city where University of Arizona happens to be. Um, notice that there are these little um, squares, these are villages, old villages of the earlier inhabitants, and there are still ruins around in those areas, and many, many canals at this point. But the canals were used to save water. They wanted needed the water for later on in the year and uh, so their crop, crops could continue to grow. And uh, they did quite a development as far as canals were concerned. Notice how they stretch all along the Gila River. And you can see some of those um, ruins and uh, what looks like the ancient ca canals uh, in Tempe. Arizona. The, let me go back here. The Pima natives did the work here. And I want to mention Pima native because there is a famous one here. Six Marines, Marines raised the flag on Iwo Jima and one of them was Ira Hayes of the Pima tribe. He had, he was one of these people here. Well, down the river, but off to the side is something called the Salton Sea. It's in Lower California. We're down into this area and notice the number of, well, so-called streams. They're pretty dry almost all year, but uh, the, the canals are now being built to give some water here to the Salton Sea, but take notice where the Salton Sea is. Here's part of the aqueduct that goes from the Colorado River to the Salton Sea. The Salton Sea is really maybe was, is a better term, 35 miles long and 15 miles, 15 miles wide. I say was because it is drying up and it has varied in size over the years. It's had a hard time staying alive. The Imperial Valley is right next to it. The Imperial Valley is, is a going concern. And notice the Salton Sea in, the, in this picture, particular picture and then the Imperial Valley just uh, below in this picture. If you look at this particular Imperial Valley, you will see uh, some cities or villages that work the area. But one of them is down here, it's called El Centro, El Centro. And we'll see pretty soon, pretty soon why that's significant. The Salt Basin becomes Salt Sea because it was a depression. All right, many years ago, the Gulf of California brought seawater into the Colorado Desert, which was in the Salt Sea. It actually came that back up through that part of the um, opening of the Colorado River. The Colorado Desert was 136 feet below sea level. The silt built build up cut off the opening to the Gulf and a dry depression developed. No more water from the Gulf. 1905 excessive rainfall in Colorado River Basin flooded the Salton Depression. This created the Salton Sea. The depression is below sea level. It is a fault connected to the San Andreas Fault the heavy use of water from the Colorado River today 
has caused the salt sea to shrink. Some of these areas have been abandoned. And I guess that is kind of apparent if you take a look at this picture. Yeah, starting to dry up. Again, we see a little bit of a problem. But they still do have a salt sea museum in this area. It's right next to whatever's left of the water. It's still quite large, but it's gradually evaporating over the years. Looking at this, this total area here, in 1904, the canal built to the, was built to the Colorado River. But in 1905, the canal clogged up with silt. So a new canal was built, but big rains caused flooding now of the salt and sea. That's where you get that part of it. 1910, Congress built levees. And 49, uh, 42, all American Canal is the name of the canal, was built. And we'll show you that right here. The canal was built and it taps the Colorado River and is going this direction. It doesn't stop here. It goes all the way to Los Angeles. El Centro is the home, I understand, of the Blue Angels. Now, if you are uh, know more about that, you may want to pipe up. But as far as I know, this is still their home. They fly all over the country, obviously. Uh, their famous museum, it really is in Pensacola, Florida. Or, uh, yeah, Pensacola, Florida. But otherwise, this is where they have their home. Imperial Valley, beautiful, green. Very green. Crops grow like very well in this area. As long as they get water, they have to get their water. Good land for farming. Warm climate allows two crops per year. The irrigation from the Colorado River is from there. And it produces winter fruits, cotton, alfalfa, and so forth. And uh, there's a picture at least of some of the area of the fruit, Five, half a million acres produce fruit, vegetables, and alfalfa, produces at least $1 million annually for the area. Once again, your alfalfa with the bales out in the, in the, in the distance in the stacks. An aerial picture of it. And they're working on it all the time. This, these people, these two uh, machines are fertilizing the area. Commercial fertilizer all over from um, much of it uh, comes from the petroleum industry. Now, what about this Los Angeles aqueduct? 1935, the Boulder Dam furnished power to Los Angeles. Nineteen forty-one, the aqueduct was completed from Lake Mead. This Los Angeles aqueduct made the made a great deal of dissatisfaction for the people in Phoenix who felt that Los Angeles was swiping their water. And if you had a Los Angeles license plate and you traveled into Phoenix, you might, uh, you might expect not only jeers and so forth, maybe, but even some stones thrown at you. They were not happy at all that Los Angeles swiped their water. Today, this aqueduct furnishes 14 cities and a total of 130 million municipalities. It wasn't necessarily just Phoenix that was unhappy. When we lived in Colorado, there was a lot of unhappiness that all the river water was heading down to California. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
Which, which city in Colorado? Well, we lived in, in the Denver area. Oh, I see. The whole, st the whole state, there was whole state. always comments about the Colorado River water was, was all being... going down to California. Yeah, okay. No, it, it was not very a happy situation for uh, this diversion. Thank you for that. All right, California, a quick picture here, uh, several pictures really, but Central Valley is also a big producer of vegetables and the like and fruit. Let's see what's, what it looks like. There's many, many pipelines that are going through here. Uh, once again, I show this only because here is the Sacramento and Joaquin River on this map. And if you've got one, you, you can see that there too. The Central Valley, yeah, they need, they have enough alfalfa and all this sort of thing to raise cattle, but they also have grapes, raisins, cotton, almonds, pistachios and citrus, and asparagus, and as well as cattle and sheep ranching. Lots of it in the Central Valley. Four hundred miles long. Oil and natural gas are under the surface, so you find quite a few of those, like in the Bakersfield area. Irrigation helps the valley produce more agriculture, and pro more products than any comparable region in the world. They really do a lot of that, but they need water. And now let's go to a water problem. Here's the Central Valley, setting up here at Reading, all the way down to Bakersfield. The Sacramento Valley is this part up here, and the San Joaquin Valley comes from here up to meet the Sacramento. And the two uh, join in its in a delta of its own. So here is the place where it actually joins and it becomes both Sacramento and San Joaquin Delta. They mash before they go into the outlet at San Francisco. <coughs> That's a good picture uh, map of that area as it comes in from the top and from the bottom, from the lower area. This is the delta area. So there's a problem and the problem is not enough water. So uh, let's see whether we can get the water, which there's plenty for in the Sacramento River and send it down to the San Joaquin. Well, let's first build a dam at Oroville. That is located on the Feather River, which is a tributary of the Sacramento. And the major water source for the Sacramento River is uh, here, and it is a, a major source for the Central Valley. They use a pumping station to pump it up uh, into the pipes that have to go on down into the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, so here you have the Sacramento River at this point and flows on, the, uh, you have to pump it down into or, or pump it up into the San Joaquin Rivers. You have to go south with it anyway. This is a good picture of where the Delta is and how it flows out, out of the San Francisco Bay here. Sacramento has the water. <coughs> San Joaquin River needs it. Look at the pipelines that they have installed. Picking up this lake up here, Oroville Lake, lake water, and letting it flow on down. By the way, a couple of years ago, they had quite a... Um, destruction of that dam for a little bit and finally got it repaired. 
but it's very vital to this whole area down in the Central Valley. Forty years ago, a farmer could bring water in at 240 feet, so they would drill their wells. Nice little picture of that whole valley. Today, water is at 1,200 feet. A little problem. Just a quick schematic showing that before they could get the water table was at this point. And then it squished on down to this. And today it's much, much lower. So if you want to get water out of the water table, it's very difficult. So quick, let's do a lot of drilling for water. And so they, people in the area, companies and so forth in, and counties quickly drilled as far as they could go, but not enough water. As a consequence, the valley, Central Valley has many pop pipelines coming off from the Sacramento. Ammon trees, uh, are plentiful, I guess almonds. The almonds are uh, the most, they, they, most almonds in the world are produced here. If I remember that statistic correctly, but it's quite famous in Central Valley, especially about, around Ripon, California. And a nice little picture of them when they are blossoming, ready for the honeybees. But that's not the only place in California. Here we have this Central Valley, nice Central Valley, but wait a minute. There's also something called the Salinas Valley, and that was called the Salad Bowl, and it still is. It opens at the Monterey Bay. It's just a short valley in here. This valley goes all the way down into uh, this part of Salinas, but there's also called the Silicon Valley, which is around Jose. And of course that is the valley of all the cyber and the um, uh, internet and construction of the uh, uh, scales for the, the internet and the like. So that's where that is located. I'm not sure much how much of a valley it is, but it's at least no, notated for its cyber construction. The Salinas River is kind of interesting in a way. I, I was noticing that on this particular map, there is something called the 101 Cafe. And now from a personal point of view, um, I was stationed near that particular highway in, near Paso Robles. And that's down here. Paso Robles had a softball team and they got a, a bunch of us soldiers to come down and be part of the team. So I played and pitched ball for 101 Cafe out of Paso Robles, how about that? But John Steinbeck, he knew all about Salinas. He wrote of mice and men. And of course it's called the salad bowl of the world. We move to another river. This river uh, starts nowhere and goes nowhere. Well, I shouldn't say it starts nowhere. It starts on land. It's one of the endoric, which means it uh, doesn't wind up in the ocean anywhere. <clears throat> it goes to the Humboldt Sink in northern Nevada and dies there. Evaporates. Again, taking a look at the Humboldt that comes into this direction. And we wind up here at Great Salt Lake. And that particular lake also does 
goes nowhere. It just takes water in and that's it. And it has to evaporate from that particular point. We'll look at the snake here a little bit later. So, but that's already on this map. <clears throat> Taking a look at the area around Great Salt Lake, uh, in the Pleistocene era, why it was bigger and Lake Bonneville it was called. Lake Bonneville in a way is still there insofar as when it rains every year, it covers quite a large area, about, oh, maybe a foot deep, two feet deep or so. And the wind blows it around, the water around, and it smooths the entire area so that when the dry season comes and the water all evaporates, it is a very smooth area. This is where they have raced cars for years on that smooth area in the dry season. And um, every year, of course, it would be smoothed out by the wind. And as you can see, it's called Lake Bonneville. In fact, Pontiac decided to name one of its cars after that. The Lake Bonneville is uh, still used for racing and setting speed records, but now uh, the sand is a little bit, or the lake bottom is a little bit uh, touchy as far as that's concerned. So they've laid down some asphalt strips to race their cars over 200 miles an hour. We're leaving that whole area going north. <clears throat> Columbia River and Snake River. Wow, how did they get formed? This river comes out of British Columbia, Columbia. Snake River is all down there in Idaho. And you have, of course, some um, geological activity in these mountains that have been built in the area. But we're interested in the rivers at this point. Again, the Columbia starts up here in, well, actually Alberta and, and then into British Columbia and finally it comes into the United States. You follow it on down, but it is joined down here by the snake. Snake joins it. So let's take a look at the snake for just a little bit. It, uh, it gets quite a bit of water, so does Columbia, from the mountains. It gets it from the uh, Rocky Mountains in this area. The Snake River is crossed. It's this nice bridge, okay, the, the canyon. And maybe some of you are anticipating what's going to happen here. Somebody tried to jump it. From this side all the way over to the other side. Before you get to it, however, you got to see the Shoshone Twin Falls. They're beautiful. And the Pelosi Falls. But how many of you guessed it was Evil Knievel? He decided to jump the canyon. Well, that is quite a ways to go. Uh, 1,500 feet, 16 really, from side to side. Hmm. How are you going to do this? Can't use your motorcycle, it will never make it. In fact, he tried and it wound up here. He didn't make it. But he decided he better get something better than that and put it on a rocket. Here's the launch ramp that he used, a dirt launch ramp. Put himself on this particular rocket and he flew across. Uh, I don't know what kind of record that really means because he did not use his motorcycle, but he did ride something across in the open. 
And that, of course, is a good tourist attraction over there in that particular area of Snake River. Let's leave that and go to the Columbia River Basin. Uh, last October, I talked about the formation of the basalt area in the India, in India. The big basin in India was also a basalt group. Well, that same thing happened over here in the Washington area. The basalt poured into this from underneath. And as a consequence, um, lots of it is in this area. And you'll notice many, many dikes in the Washington area of this basalt group. Now, that's not the only thing that happens here in the Columbia River because it gets messed up with the uh, glaciers and so forth. But at least if you look at the intrusions, the dikes that were formed from the basalt intrusions from underneath way back in the Mycenaean epoch, making this large area basalt, flood basalt, they call it. I'd like to point out here that we are going down the Columbia River, but it is well occupied uh, with nice little places that remind you that, hey, something really happened here. Not only was this flood basalt coming along, but there's a different flood that occurred. We'll look at that in a moment. Here's the basalt layers. This might remind you, these basalt barrier uh, pillars, possibly of the Devil's Tower over in, uh, in Wyoming, because it's the same kind of basalt, except that was made by a volcano er uh, eruption that uh, uh, left, and then the basalt was pushed into the throat of the volcano. And here it was swarmed over by a flood. So, but the pillars, when it cools, it forms columns, it's basalt. Something called the Missoula floods. The periodic floods across Eastern Washington down the Columbia River Gorge and the Willamette Valley. Ice dams created glacial Lake Missoula. Here's that glacier again. Keep running into it. This, the one over on this side um, will show you just entering into the United States. And that the Cordillian ice sheet does push into Washington state somewhat at that time, 18,000 years ago. All right, but there's an ice dam that forms at this point. And the, the material that comes into contact with warmer weather, of course it melts. And so you get quite a bit of water. Water starts to build up in large amounts in what is now known, what was then known as the Lake Missoula. This ice dam right here held it from moving down the Colorado. However, that's going to change. Here's that point where the ice dam is. 55 years happened between floods, 40 times over 2000 year period, these floods came. 15,000 to 13,000 years ago, the flood traveled at 60 miles an hour. It rolled huge boulders along, like this one. It's an erratic in the area. But that flood really tore up the land as you went on down into the Columbia. 
So at that particular time, it flooded many parts of the Columbia and the landscape around it. So when the ice dam broke here, and it must have done it uh, many times, as it built up year, uh, over the years, it would then flood again and then flood again. It just took a bite out of whatever was down here as it flowed down the, the river. These are called the scabbards, scablands. Grand Coulee Dam is right in here. If some of you may have visited it. Uh, also something called the Dry Falls is located in this area. All right. Super cooled water uh, got into the edges of the ice dam. And as it was super cooled, it actually froze the ice further and cracked it. Now, how that works exactly is uh, rather interesting. And when it cracked it, it allowed the water to seep into it and then it broke it all apart and the ice dam broke. And, uh, and that happened how many times? 40 times. And it let all this water flood down the Columbia. Releases water from this Lake Missoula. An artist picture, obviously they didn't know what it was in, but supposedly shows you what's happening when this uh, gets released. The amount of water that came down was a half of what Lake Michigan would have. But this now is 800, 800 feet deep, just flowing on down at 60 miles an hour. The potholes were created by swirling bubbles that form tornadoes in the water. You can see those today. And there's the long waterfall. These dry falls uh, were then at that point um, covered of course with water and there's a pool down below where it flood, the plunge pool. This thing is five times wider than the Niagara. It must have been some tremendous sight. Here are the scab lands, as we just mentioned a moment ago. The scab lands look like this from the air. Next to them is a very profitable land for farming. But there's a coulee area and in this coulee area, they stopped up the Columbia River and built the Grand Coulee Dam. That's what it looks like from the air, controlling the water in the Columbia. So the Lake Missoula flood again and again and again resulted in the scab lands. Once again, you see the landscape, Grand Coulee right here. And what's left of uh, Lake Lewis was formed for a while. It's still there, but uh, much smaller than what you have here. And that pretty well takes it up. I don't know if there's some comments that you want to make at this or do you want to ask some questions, which I don't have the answers to? I don't have uh, any questions in the chat. So if you would like to unmute yourself and ask a question or make comments, please feel free to do so now. I'd like to make a comment or two. Go ahead. I've got a family that start, well, one end is up in Colorado, on the Colorado River. Okay. The other is down in Texas, including uh, the Colorado River under in Austin, and then uh, the uh, Great Bend, because my daughter lives down in Texas, and they've been to the Great Bend for many occasions, and my brother 
is an ardent fan of Lake Powell and fishing. Wonderful. Just Thank comment. you for that contribution. Now, did I say anything that was wrong about the Colorado River? No, not that I know of. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just one comment about Lake Powell. Years ago, we had done a houseboating on Lake Powell and Good. had a great time. But as I understand now, the water levels are substantially lower than they were back then. Oh. And, and much of it isn't as accessible as it used to be. Because we could, we, we could park at Rainbow Bridge then, but you, you have to walk there now. <clears throat> Thank you very much for that. I'm wondering if you have a concern about running out of water from the Colorado. When I go to Arizona, um, I'm always uh, aware of the huge amount of building going on and just more and more apartments and hotels and everything. And um, there have been many articles in the paper over the years about the water supply. Yes, uh, I, I know they are concerned about that particularly. Uh, some of the irrigation that has gone on in that area, like in around Phoenix and so forth, uh, they sort of just stopped it because of the water problem. But it is a big problem. There were two things. There were two things that a lawyer had to know when, if he was educated or she was educated in the East, they had to know about water legislation when they went into the West because that was a primary concern of almost everyone. Well, in my understanding that if you buy in an area, you're supposed to have 100 years of water guarantee. Oh, interesting. Yeah, great, <laughs> great. I don't know how they can do that. I don't know either. <laughs> hey, some great comments. Anybody else? Now, we do have a quiz coming up, don't we? Let's go through the quiz a moment. And if you anybody else thinks of more questions or comments that they want to make, we can do that. So we're here, <clears throat> we're here at Number one is easy. And number two is K, Kim for K. Got that? Number three is Doug. Number four is Peter. Five is love. Six is Oboe. Seven is Charlie. Eight is Jig. Nine is Nan. Ten is Baker. Eleven is Mike. 12 is Fox, 13 is How, 14 is Abel, 15 is George. And that's, uh, unless there's some more comments that you'd like to make, that pretty well takes care of this session. Uh, Jerry, someone is asking, Ben is asking if you know what safety measures have been taken to avoid major catastrophes involving the country's river dams. No, I, I, maybe someone else knows. I do not know what kind of safety they have had for that. Okay. Okay. Jerry? Go ahead. Jerry, <clears throat> um, we are wondering if this goes back to last week, I think, on the Illinois River but there is apparently a really great park on the Illinois River in Northern Illinois called Starve Rock. Yes. Are you familiar with that? I just know that there is one there. I, I have not been there. Okay, we have um, our, our uh, sister and her husband went out there one time and they, and I, we understand now why it's called Starve Rock, but there's supposed to be a really nice falls that will always be, um, a good for a photo shoot and they got out there and it had been so um, so dry that they got to the falls and there was nothing going on. There was just 
like the rocks were starved because there was, there was, there was no, no water. So I guess you have to call ahead if you want to see the very, the very beautiful park in the, in the falls at Star, for, Star for Rock. Yep. Well, I, I, mean, I, I have been to Star Rock a couple of times and it's absolutely beautiful. Um, there's boat tours you can take down the river that goes through it. And there's hiking trips you can take. And yeah, it's just a gorgeous place. Okay, great. All right. Thank you, Kathy. Yeah. Anybody else on something like that? That's great. One year when um, my husband and I went to Sacaton, which is not too far from Casa Grande, Arizona. Okay. Uh, they have a Ira Hayes celebration every year. And we thought it would be very small. And they had floats. They had many uh, Native American tribes. Uh, of course, many, many military, Marines, and so on. And it was a big festival. And it was yeah. so wonderful to be there. And I think it was in Sacaton. It's just a tiny village where he was from. OK, all right. Great, thank you for that. You're welcome. Any, anyone else? Just wanted right. to comment that the uh, trip down the Colorado was so in informative. You just captured everything, I think, along the way. The, uh, <clears throat> my wife doesn't like me to tell this, but uh, we were on the float boat and she dropped her sunglasses. Oh no. And so <clears throat> when we got down to the Peach Creek down below there, I've been telling people that she found her so sunglasses floating by. <laughs> Some people actually believe that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that was a very interesting kind of trip. One more comment. I just signed up for a riverboat cruise on the Colombian Snake River Ooh. that will I do that I will do in July. And so this is very, very interesting to me. Okay. <clears throat> the Columbia does have a dam uh, on it, um, I guess before, after the snake joins it. Uh, I wonder whether that float boat goes around that or not. Well, I'll find out, won't I? Yeah. What, what I miss is seeing your faces and find, and seeing whether you're smiling or, or scowling. And uh, uh, someday we're, we might be able to be in this classroom again. Right. You didn't, Believe me, we're you smiling. Didn't. Along with the chipmunk. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you didn't mention too much about the Salmon River, but a few years ago we did a, how many days? Six, An eight, eight, six or seven Six day. or seven day glamping trip down the Salmon River. Okay. And that was fantastic as well. Lots of petroglyphs, lots of whitewater rafting. It was, it was quite, quite wonderful. Wonderful. Hey, I really appreciate your uh, contributing, uh, Mr. James Hagel. Is that right? <laughs> yes. Jim and Janet. Jim and Janet. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for contributing. Anyone else? Oh, I yeah. thank you. I thank you because I haven't um, been west at all. So the, lot, today's material was totally new to me. I knew at least I knew something about last week's, but this has been very informative. Thank you. Okay. Great. Well, Thanks, Sally. Just one, one other thought too. You talk about those Northwest rivers. So much of that was navigated by Lewis and Clark, and there's tremendous history out there uh, regarding the Lewis and Clark expedition. You are so right. Yes, yes. Maybe that's your next class, Jer. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> One um, of the fun things about the Colorado River in uh, Austin, Texas, was the bridge under which all the bats collect themselves. Oh, oh, okay. How about that? No mosquitoes around then. <laughs> sure helps. Yes. They like mosquitoes. 
All right. Well, thank you everyone for being here today. Thank yes. you, Jerry, for another great geography class. We appreciate it. And thank okay. you for the class for contributing so much today. Appreciate yeah. that too. That was fun. Thanks so much, everyone. We hope you have a great day. All right.